policy or practice that stands out the most uh, in my mind was this one of strip searching. I remember I was about maybe uh, 12 and uh, you know feeling uncomfortable having to remove my shirt or my undershirt and I remember thinking you know how audacious it was at the time what, for what, what purpose could it all you know serve for me to remove my undershirt other than to embarrass me you know and I was crying and pleading with my mother to ask her. We were separated, and I was asked to go with a, a uniformed uh, officer. And she asked me to undress. Having grown up in a uh, Christian family in Nazareth, um, I was quite modest. And she had me turn around. Uh, she felt my legs, my behind. So there I was as a 10-year-old in this little room, um, just about completely naked, and knew that I could not challenge what was happening and I just complied. It just feels, sitting here as an adult, that as a child I really shouldn't have had to go through that. I was uh, born in Englewood, New Jersey, and I was raised in Cliffside Park, New Jersey, which is where I still live. I was student council president, editor of my yearbook. I remember being seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, being strip searched. I remember being really little and being strip searched and having them have me take off my pantyhose and because I had cerebral palsy, not being able to put the pantyhose back on. They took me to strip search me. I said, well, listen, I need a maxi pad right now. One of the Israeli security females, when they confiscated my stuff and wouldn't give me a maxi pad, started crying. And she had her, 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 uh, her security tag like taken off of her neck and she was sent away. There's nothing more horrifying or embarrassing you can do to a woman than have her sit there and bleed all over herself. I said, will you at least admit that you're doing this to me because I'm of Arab descent? And she said, yes. It made me feel like they're above the law. There's nothing they can't do. If they've gotten to the point where they cannot give a girl in a wheelchair her maxi pad, there's really nothing that's sacred. There's nothing that's holy. There's nothing that's safe. There were several women, none of whom said a word. No one spoke up, no one. So now I'm embarking on a 12-hour flight in first class, covered in blood, and the, I get in and the flight attendant just looks at me like with such disgust. As a disabled person, I just felt like it was my worst fear come true, the idea of not being able to take care of myself and just being a mess. I try not to think of being over London and just feeling like I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I remember my mother um, being next to me and being told that she had to remove her um, pad. You just, you had to kind of submit because they were occupiers and they had the machine guns with them and we didn't. And so you had to be quiet. You couldn't really say much or argue. The last time I saw my parents, I was 14 and they sent me 
on a children's transport, a kinder transport to England. And by sending me there, they literally gave life to me a second time. In 1981, I went back to the camps where my parents had been. The last camp was Auschwitz. That's when I finally accepted there's no way that they survived or that other family members survived. typed my name in the computer and instantly, like growing out of the, the floor, were two men who identified themselves as um, security. Their name tags were turned around. I was wanded and, pat and patted down, and then I was told to get undressed. And I said, you have no right to do this. So I got undressed. And then I was told to bend over, and I was internally searched. And I said, why are you doing this? They said, because you're a terrorist, because you're a security risk. I have never in my whole life been so angry. I've never been so embarrassed in my life. Why would you go to such lengths to humiliate someone? This was something done purely to humiliate and for no other purpose. That was part of the policy, it was intentional. It was meant to um, make Palestinians detest going back. Teaching us Palestinians a lesson don't come back. It's intimidation, and that's what they try to do, so that we don't report back what we really see. Well, if they don't want the United States or the world to know, then don't do it. When I landed in the U.S., I called my friends in Palestine, and the first thing I said to them is, I'm never coming back. I haven't been back home since I was 10 years old. One of the reasons it is difficult for me to think about going back home to Nazareth is that the thought of being placed in that same position I was in as a 10-year-old and not being able to do anything about it is too much for me. There are these magazines in the back seat. I, on every page, in every one of these magazines, and in the magazines that were in, in, where my friend was sitting, I wrote, I'm a Holocaust survivor. I will never, ever come back to Israel. That's what they want. They want us to get to the point where we don't go back. Thank you.